So these were the big issues. And um, the idea of mission to the Jews has been so central to Christian doctrine <laughs> since the beginning that nobody expected that it would change. Because after all, Christianity in its nature is a missionary religion. You're asking them to give up the very nature of their religion, or at least to give it up as it relates to one particular group, namely the group that they want to convert the most to establish their own authenticity, namely the Jews. Heschel considered this the critical issue because this would establish what he considered the um, integrity, was the word he used, the recognition of the integrity of Judaism as a self-standing religion in itself rather than as a prelude to Christianity. This was the bottom line of the whole thing, mission to the Jews. And eventually, it happened. In the Vatican Council's schema, paragraph four, which is the paragraph on the Jews, called in Latin it's called Nostri Tate. There'll be a lot of books coming out about it next year because it's the big anniversary <laughs> of Nostri Tate. 1965 was finally adopted. means in our times. <clears throat> and according to some church observers, Nostritate was the most radical document of the entire Second Vatican Council, uh, even though a lot of the other docu documents were very radical. And I would suggest that uh, the issue has not completely been resolved. Because even though the church has accepted Nostri Tate, and even though John Paul II, through his pontificate, was extremely strong advocate for Catholic Jewish relations, um, there still remains this doctrine in the church teachings. And if you ask to most lay Catholics, do you believe that the church should renounce their notion of mission to the Jews? They'll say no, because we're a missionary religion. And our goal is evangelization. I mean, that's our mission, evangelization, which means to make everybody part of the church. That's why it's called the Catholic Church everybody, and that we can't give this up. So I still see, there's a lot of uh, stuff came to a head during the pontificate of, uh, of what's his name, the German one, if I know the one. Reitzinger. Pardon me? Reitzinger. Reitzinger. What's his pope name? Benedict. Oh, Benedict, yeah. Then a lot came up during his pontificate about, about this. And uh, there is a, an office in the Vatican called the uh, Pontificate Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews, uh, which was established uh, by Pope Paul VI, with whom Heschel had meetings, and the first occupant because Bayer was already dead. He was slated to be the first occupant, but his assistant became a cardinal, and he became the first occupant of that, of the head of that commission, and that was the Cardinal Johannes Wilbrands, who was a Dutch um, cardinal who I knew. I worked with him. And uh, he knew a lot about Judaism. And uh, you know, it became then a crapshoot in terms of whether the people who succeeded him, 
and after the Vatican Council, were really up on Jewish things or not. Really knew anything about Jews. The current guy doesn't know his, you know, doesn't know which end is up. He's a nice Swiss um, cardinal, Cardinal Baum, who's now president of the commission. I, I never met him. I never met him. Uh, he doesn't seem. He seems to run around making pork pies all the time and embarrassing himself. Um, and uh, Benedict, I'm not really sure. He was very conservative theologically, and uh, I'm not sure he could make, make the movement. And, you know, having a pope who had been a member of the Hitler Youth is a little problematic anyway. Uh, the new guy, I think, will be pretty good. But he doesn't seem very obsessed with theology. Uh, I worked very closely with uh, one of the uh, two, two of the previous cardinals who were president of this commission. Um, one was a, an, an Irish Australian cardinal, uh, Cardinal Cassidy, his name was. And he was very good. He, under, he understood the politics of all this, not only the theology. Uh, he had been the ambassador of the Vatican to South Africa during the apartheid. And he had later been the ambassador of the Vatican to Russia after the collapse of communism. So he was a really sharp, adept politician. But he, knew, he knew the ropes. But uh, I'm not sure how important these issues are anymore on the, on the burner of the Catholic Church. And I see it already here in Chicago, where we were one of the most avant-garde communities in Catholic Jewish relations in the world. Uh, but now the Catholic Church with the pedophilia business and having to talk to the Muslims and all the other problems they have with the financing the Catholic school system and stuff like this have sort of put Catholic-Jewish relations on the back burner. But in Heschel's time, it was on the front burner. And it was a very hot issue and a very uh, an issue we put a lot of energy in. That he was very instrumental in, in getting this uh, adopted by the Second Vatican Council. Uh, he thought, well, you know, we get it adopted by the Vatican Council, so it would be like a lot of for them. You know, so they'd have to do it. And then in 74, they issued the Commission on Relations with the Jews, issued guidelines for the implementation of No Street Cafe. So we figured now we have guidelines on how to teach Catholicism in the parochial schools based on the guidelines in Nostri Tate and how to talk about Jews from the pulpits. And we figured the whole issue was resolved. Well, unfortunately, we were wrong. So it's sort of my recent experience that I see uh, far from resolved. With the Protestants, also there were problems. Heschel was, I mentioned, he was very close to Reinhold Niebuhr. He had served as a visiting professor, the first Jew ever to serve as a visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary, where Niebuhr had taught. He knew all the people over at the National Council of Churches, which is in New York, otherwise called the Protestant Vatican. And so everything seemed cool with the Protestants. And all that's changed, uh, especially regarding uh, the liberal Protestant churches and views on Israel and views on the Middle East and investments in Israel and all this. So it's a very different world today than it was then, but th that was a pioneering generation in the field of interfaith relations. <laughs> Muslims in those days, interfaith relations with Muslims, nobody even talked about it. Heschel had a few encounters uh, informally, but nobody was doing formal interfaith relations with the Muslims then, as they are now. Interestingly, though, during the Vietnam War, uh, Heschel had a lot of interactions because of protests against the Vietnam War with Buddhist monks. 
So these weren't religious dialogues or theological dialogues, but he was involved in a number of dialogues with some very famous uh, Vietnamese Buddhist monks who, who came over to the United States at that time. Now this is a whole area that itself is very intriguing because Judaism had not really encountered the Eastern religions. And we don't have the same baggage and history with the Eastern religions than we have with Buddha, with Christianity and Islam. We have a, a literature, particularly a halakhic literature, regarding Christian-Jewish relations and Muslim-Jewish relations. And in Heschel's famous essay on interfaith relations, no religion is an island, he quotes you know, some texts dealing with this. But we have no texts let's say, on, on Hinduism or Buddhism or Zoroastrianism or something like this. So I have no idea what Heschel really thought about the propriety of interfaith relations with Eastern religions. And here is the issue. Halakhically, the big issue in interfaith relations beginning with Christianity in the ancient and medieval times was, is religion X idolatry? If it is, we can't have interfaith relations with them. <coughs> we don't consider them a valid faith. As Heschel says in his No Religion is an Island speech, <coughs> speech uh, the prerequisite for interfaith relations is faith. So if they're not a valid religious faith, they don't believe in God, and one God, we can't have <coughs> interfaith relations with them, we can't have religious dialogue with them. But I have no idea what he thought about this in relation, let's say, to Buddhism. Is Buddhism an idolatrous religion? Is Hinduism an idolatrous religion? Well, they have statues. They have more than one God. They bow down to statues. Seems so, but maybe not. No. Didn't, didn't confront that issue. So I have no idea what he might have thought or what he might have done. Also, you have to remember the immigration laws in the United States changed in the 90, early 90s with the repeal of the McCarran Act, which let immigration come from Asia. And with the immigration from India and China and all these places, and after the Vietnam War from Vietnam, all of these people with Eastern religions began to come into the United States, so it all of a sudden became an issue for the American Jewish community. How do we relate to people of these other religions? And just two more points. Number one, we have this bizarre phenomenon, I think it's bizarre, of the Jewish Buddhists in America, where one-third of the Buddhists in America are Jews. Can you be a Jew and a Buddhist at the same time? Well, if Buddhism is idolatry, doesn't seem to be the case. And the final issue is, in 1988, a group of us, in 1993 was the centenary, would be the centenary of the Parliament of World Religions held here in Chicago in 1893. Now, interestingly, in this great event, the Parliament of World Religions held at the Great World Fair and announcing the 20th century, Catholicism was not allowed to be represented. So we had at this meeting representatives from the Archdiocese, and the Cardinal told them, you know, be careful to remind everybody we weren't at the last one. They didn't let us there. Jews were there. But Catholics weren't allowed there. And the big speaker there was this, ooh, this um, Hindu Swami. Yeah, yeah Vivekananda. So we formed a committee called the Committee for the, for the Council of World Religions, and we decided we'd try to make a, 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 a convention 
mention it a hundred years later, 1993, and we pulled it off. We had it here in Chicago. The first question was, what is a religion? Who do we invite and who do we not invite? And so immediately two schools developed. And this was an interfaith group of which I was part. Those who wanted a very inclusive definition and those who didn't. And interestingly, the Catholics who were excluded from the first one wanted the most exclusive definition. I'll give you two examples that we had to deal with. One was, of course, we invite the Muslims. Of course, there was no question. It was before 9-11, so of course, there was not even an issue. So what about Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam? Does that include them? So we had a meeting with the Council of, of American Muslims. And they said the most remarkable thing. We don't consider Louis Farrakhan Muslim. Well, that resolved that, you know. I didn't expect that to happen. Then we get a petition from this group in New York with all, all, all signed, all on, on stationary or some big law firm in New York, signed by all Jewish women, women with Jewish names. This was the the, um, what do you call it? The witches. Wicca. The witches. <laughs> they were all Jewish law women lawyers. We're a religion too. So we, I voted against it, I have to admit, because I didn't like this. It was all Jewish women, but I voted against it. But they were accepted, and they were represented at the, at the convention. Then they wanted on the new moon, which fell during the convention, to welcome the new moon by dancing in the mood at midnight across the street in the park here. And the city of Chicago Parks Department issued a restraining order. They didn't give them a permit. So they sued. Eventually, we came, they came to a compromise. They could dance, but not in the mood, even at midnight. It's strange, you see across the street, there's a sign, park closed at 11. I don't know how you can close a park, but this was at 12. So we found out in 68. Pardon me? We found out in 68 how you yeah, closed well, the park. that was another story. So, you know, these were the issues. So, the, what my point is that the world of interfaith relations today in America is so much more complicated than the world that Heschel faced, which was basically the Catholic Church, you know, which spoke it then with one voice, and the liberal Protestants. They weren't having any dialogue with evangelicals. Nobody even heard about evangelicals too much then, at least the North here. So that was that those were the two major arenas of interfaith relations. So I'm always wondering, you know, what how would Heschel have handled it today when, you know, you have hundreds of different religious groups. Uh, there's now in the U.S. military a, uh, a Wicca chaplain. And in Afghanistan, in Arlington National Cemetery, there is a Wicca grave of a soldier who was a Wiccan uh, killed in Afghanistan. So all of these things are, you know, real things that, you know, he wouldn't have had to, to worry about. And as I mentioned before, whether or not the issues that he was involved so heavily with in dialogue with the Catholic Church during Vatican II, which seemed to have been resolved a long time ago, uh, really have been resolved. I really have my doubts about that. From what I see lately, they really haven't been uh, very well resolved. Are there any questions? Please. I don't know whether uh, Jews killing Jesus was on the issue. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jews killing Jesus was on there. 
And uh, when when the Second Vatican uh, Council, when Nostri Tate came out, those were the headlines. Catholic Church forgives Jews. I remember the, the headlines. Catholic Church. Catholic Jews Church Jews forgives for Jews for killing Christ. Yeah. I remember the headlines in the New York uh, tabloid newspapers, which don't exist anymore. New York, New York, New York, or Daily News. Yeah, and and the Jews did not take it well. They said, "Well, we don't need you to do this," but actually, we did. Some because Some because it really, you know brought a lot of anti-Semitism to believe that, now the church said. But most Catholics didn't really accept it, even though the, the church said it. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting, when John the 23rd died, who do you think President Kennedy, our first Catholic president, I think our only Catholic president, Sent to the as one of the representatives of the United States to the funeral, Finkelstein. Who was also the one who gave the invocation at Eisenhower's second inauguration. came to Charisma, Finkelstein was the first, I think the first Jew ever to be uh, on the cover of uh, Time magazine. I mean the first religious figure, of course you had Einstein, people like this, but the first religious figure. Couldn't undo when it came to to uh, charisma. I was once on, a, on an elevator with him and Arthur Goldberg. Goldberg was then U.S. ambassador to the U.N. It was after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy wanted him at the U.N. rather than in the Supreme Court. And he's the, one of the only people in American history who resigned the chair in the Supreme Court. It's a lively point. The rumor is that Kennedy promised to reappoint him later on and never did. Of course, he got shot in the meantime. Johnson didn't reappoint him either. Johnson appointed his idiot friend, Fortas, who later resigned because people realized he was an idiot. <laughs> Probably never read the Constitution. <clears throat> but I was on the elevator and, and I mean, he was coming up from the bottom floor, so I didn't know who was there. And I the button and the door opens and there's people standing with this guy. And they start talking. And, and the thing I noticed was, and people stand introduced me, that this is uh, Justice Goldberg. And uh, we're riding up in this very ancient elevator, uh, which didn't go very fast. And I noticed in the conversation, Goldberg always referred to him deferentially as Dr. Finkelstein, and Finkelstein referred to Goldberg, except when he introduced me, as Arthur. That tells you a lot. Now, this is not some schnook, you know, owner of a grocery store, owner <laughs> off the street. Yeah. Um, Ka Kaplan in, his, in the second volume, spends a significant amount of time describing Heschel at Vatican, in negotiations with the Vatican. Right. And he doesn't I, come off do, he doesn't, he doesn't come off off well. well. It sounds like a loose cannon, and, right. and I want to get your opinion on whether that's a, a accurate. Well, I wasn't there, so I, don't, I know exactly what you're referring to. That's when he went with the representative of the ADL. And uh, I didn't have a feeling that, uh, I mean, my view is that it didn't happen that way. I mean, I can't prove it. I don't know it for sure. I wasn't there. But um, I don't understand why a 
and put it another way. I couldn't understand, I can't understand why this guy, I forgot his name, who went with him from the ADL in Europe, um, portrayed it that way. I can understand why. Having been involved myself for many years in interfaith relations, it's very clear to me what the motivations were, and I'll tell you what it is in a minute. But based on, you know, Heschel's activities in interfaith relations, um, in every other arena, I see no reason to why one should believe that it actually happened in such a disastrous way. And uh, a number of uh, people who I know who are experts in interfaith relations and experts in Heschel and experts in all this who I meet at conferences on these subjects, uh, we had a conference, there was a conference, for example, at Brunel College in Iowa um, it's a long story, but um, a friend of mine is a professor there who was retired, Harold Kazimov. He's a Holocaust survivor, and he wrote a dissertation on Heschel, studied with Heschel. And uh, for his retirement, uh, they asked him what they want, what he wanted, and he wanted a conference on Heschel. So I, I went to the conference, and it was held at, at Grinnell College in Iowa. And at the conference was Kaplan, who I, I had met, you know, years before, here and there. And, and Kazimov just, you know, said to him, I wish you, he said, if it would have been a choice between putting that story in, whether it's true or not, or publishing the book, you should have not published the book. Because you don't know whether it's true. And if it is true, you shouldn't have published the book, because it diminishes a great man. And if it isn't true, you shouldn't have published it, because you shouldn't publish a lie, which is a libel. That's what he said. He was unusually emotional about it. Uh, so I, I, I tend to think it's it maybe has a grain of truth, but I, I tend to think it's, it's you know, an exaggeration. Now, why do I think it, it may be, you know, it, it, there are motivations for it? Here's the problem. Let me give another example which relates to this. There's this movie just came out, Son of God, right? Mm -hmm. There were three religious advisors to this, or, or I don't know if you want to call them advisors, but three people, they let see it to see what they thought before they allowed it to be shown in public. One was Archbishop so-and-so, one was Reverend so-and-so, and one was Abe Foxman of the ADL. Those were the three experts they brought in because they didn't want to offend anybody with this movie and they wanted it accurate. And that event, in my view, tells you the whole problem with the way interfaith relations has been conducted in this country. And as a person who spent four, over four years doing it, I can talk from the inside as well as the outside. In other words, you have secular advocacy or what used to be called defense organizations, talking about theological subjects or religious subjects, have people who are totally secular and unschooled in any of this representing us to talk about things they know nothing about with people who are steeped in theology. And that, it seems, it doesn't seem to me, I know, sends the wrong message, when, especially when you're trying to set up a dialogue with these other groups. How can you, that's why Heschel put that line in his essay, The No Religion is an Island, the prerequisite for interfaith is faith. 
you have a secular organization like the American Jewish Committee talking to the, let's say, the Council, the Council of Catholic Bishops of the United States, or the National Council of Churches, or you know, one of these groups, it's apples and oranges. It should be the synagogue organizations or the rabbinic organizations talking to the priest and minister organizations or the synagogue organizations talking to the church organizations. Where does the ADL, American Jewish Committee, or federations pop in as the representatives of Judaism and the Jewish people talking to supposedly their counterparts. That's the big problem everywhere, including here in Chicago. Why is the Jewish Federation of Chicago uh, the ones talking to the Archdiocese of Chicago? Why are functionaries of the Jewish Federation representing Judaism in theological dialogue with the Cardinal, who I know and who is a very astute uh, theologian. Where are their credentials? I mean, you know, if you have a, a legal problem, you have the lawyers fight it out. You know, if your car breaks down, you call a mechanic. You don't call a social worker. And that's, in my view, the big problem. Now, when I was involved years ago in interfaith relations in Poland, that's why I succeeded there, where not, none of the American <coughs> Jewish organizations that put a lot of more money into it than I could you know, get behind me. That's why I succeeded while they failed, because I could speak theology with their theologians. And they didn't understand, because you know, they're European, so they don't understand how things work here. Here, you know, the Catholic Church understands how things work. So they know they have to talk to the ADL and the American Jewish Committee. But in Poland, they never heard of them. All they hear is rabbi, they hear you're a theologian, so they want to have theological doc uh, uh, discussions with you. Uh, they're not interested in uh, defense organizations and all this other stuff. And, uh, and Heschel, I think, was in an ambivalent situation because he was involved in a theological dialogue, but he had, as I mentioned the other day, his handlers. And in this case, he had Mark Tannenbaum of the American Jewish Committee as his major handler in talking to the Catholics. So if he's coming as a Jewish scholar, there's no theologian, there's no problem. If he's coming as a representative of the American Jewish Committee, why, why would the Vatican want to talk to him? What do they care about the American? Why do they care about the Chicago Jewish Federation? Why do they care about the ADL? They don't. And, and that's the problem. In this country, of course, the Catholic Church has unfortunately come to understand this. But they know, you know, that's where the action is, that's where, it's, that's where the politics are. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as Cassidy, Cardinal Cassidy, said to me once, he said, our problem is we're talking to all the wrong people, and we know it. But that's who you want us to talk to. That's who you give us to talk to. And you want interfaith dialogue without the faith and without the dialogue. <laughs> and he was right. And uh, this is uh, this is still the problem. So that line in Heschel's No Religion is an Island, which was given at Union Theological Seminary, by the way, uh, no, there's no interfaith relations without faith. The premise of interfaith relations is faith. It seems to me is the bottom line for the whole thing. So that's the problem. And of course, each religion has its, its, you know, its own baggage to carry. With the Muslim dialogue, it's a whole other business we have. But in many ways.
ways to dialogue with the Muslims is much easier than the Christians. Of course, 9-11 got in the way, but uh, until then it was much easier because we have much more in common with the Muslims than we have with the Christians. And remember, people who choose them, think about it. One third of all of Jewish religious literature is written in Arabic. One third. Almost all our greatest works in, in Jewish thought uh, are in Arabic. Yes, sir. I'm not sure what you mean by handlers. You mean like an advisor? A handler seems to be. I mean like an head. agent. I mean What's like that? a guy, an agent, the guy that shows you which way, where to go. Okay. So you're not saying that the, the handlers have power over Heschel to tell him what he should do or not? I don't, I don't think power is the right word. Yeah. I'd say guidance. Guidance, okay. Because he knew that in a sense he was very naive politically, so you know, he needed people who, who knew the ropes, and especially in the American Jewish uh, you know, uh, organizational uh, establishment and leadership. It's a very complicated business. It's even more complicated then than now because there were more uh, alphabets in the alphabet soup. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, you still had, you had the American Jewish Committee, which you still have. Uh, you had those uh, counterbalancing at the American Jewish Congress, which, you know, had its endowment invested by Madoff, so they're gone. Uh, you had all kinds of other organizations uh, that sort of petered out uh, since, uh, since the 60s. So it was more complicated than that, which is, in my view, bad, because when you have a centralization of power, the possibility of expression is lessened, and the possibility of dissent is lessened. power to squelch the centers is heightened. And that's what I think we have now. Yeah. So here's a question. Um, so Heschel helped basically write the Vatican, the Vatican II. I mean, there he was helping on the details and all that, right? I wouldn't say he helped uh, write it. No, they wrote it. But he, sort of gave them the guidelines in terms okay. of, you know, what would the Jewish community want to see in it. But it, remember, it's a Catholic document, so what the Jewish community would want to see in it is only one little part of the story. Sure. Okay. So I want to go from there back to the civil rights work. Um, recently it was in a market birthday and last year to coordinate with Heschel or somehow. Anyway, and on the internet I saw this big thing about the writing of the Civil Rights Act. And the reform movement was taking a lot of credit about how the Civil Rights Act was drafted or written in great part at their rack office. So I'm asking if Heschel had any role formally or if he was consulted at all with any Jewish coalition that was looking Jewishly and helping write the Civil Rights Act. Does that make any sense? No, I don't think so. I mean, my, does my question make sense? <laughs> no, the question makes sense, but... The but that didn't no. happen. No, because that was already politics. Okay. You know, he was trying... Until the Nixon business, he was really dealing with the overreaching moral issues and not getting into the politics. Legislation is already politics. Okay. And, and I have no problem you know, with uh, whoever wants to get involved to get involved in writing legislation. But uh, in terms of the interfaith, and interfaith documents, I, I do have a problem with people who know absolutely nothing about it uh, getting involved in it. You know, you, you have 
to know. I mean, when I was undergraduate, I was preparing myself as part of what I expect to be doing in the future to to be involved in Catholic Jewish relations. So I was already as an undergraduate involved in Catholic Jewish relations. Now this was before Vatican II, so I was studying all of the scholastic uh, Catholic theologians. I knew Aquinas very well, and Scotus, and Brad Wardine, and all these guys, you know, because I figured that's, you have to know their language, you have to know how they think in order to deal with them. You know, then along came Vatican II, which basically said, we don't care about that stuff anymore. It's, you know, it's not Nostra Aetate, it's not in our time. So, you know, we don't, we don't need the precedents we used to need to quote. You know, they always used to quote Aquinas, you know. You look at the Vatican II documents, where is Aquinas? Not there. So I studied all this stuff and, you know, didn't really do very much with it. It came obsolete after Vatican II. But if you're going to participate in writing their their documents and trying to advise them on, you know, thinking through these problems, internal problems in, in church theology, you have to know something about church theology. You have to be able to speak their language. And in my work, my own work in interfaith relations, that's what I found in these meetings people on the other side appreciated the most, that I, I understood, you know, their language. So if I would go to one of these meetings, whether it was here or overseas, and I would say to people, Protestants or Catholics, i say, what do you do? i say, I'm a Jewish theologian. And they understand that. If I would go to a Jewish meeting and say, I'm a Jewish theologian, they'd say, what? There is no such thing. Or, you know, uh, get a real job. <laughs> uh, the Christians understood it very well. So, uh, you would, I, I don't think Eschel had any role in this because this was written by people that knew how to write legislation, which he didn't know. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the religious documents, you know, he, he did know how they thought. He did know, you know, what what the right language was. He didn't know what buttons to press. Um, and you can see, uh, again, the polemics if you look uh, carefully enough. Yes, sir? Uh, I think that Nostra Tate didn't go far enough because when you mention Aquinas, that's the problem, like the church fathers and them not rejecting them or denouncing them. So when you talk to Jews from, Latin, I mean, to uh, Catholics from Latin America or from other parts of the world, they see uh, Vatican II as like a liberal takeover of their tradition. And they're like, we still build churches in the name of the church fathers and we still teach their stuff. And whatever they said was nice, but that's not really what we believe. So uh, it was very superficial and cosmetic of a, of a movement to build relations with the Jewish community. It seemed like it, it really got to the core of the problem. Well, I absolutely agree with you. My own experience is that the thing that bothered traditional Catholics the most was not anything relating to the attitudes toward the Church Fathers or to the medieval philosophers, but to the saints. You know, they sort of degraded the saints in Vatican II. Even Joseph, you know, Mary's husband, was, you know, desainted or whatever it's called. He was no longer considered a saint. And and people just couldn't buy it. Catholics who I grew up with, especially Italian Catholics, because half of their kids are named Joseph, you know, Giuseppe, uh, they 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 just went crazy. They they couldn't buy it. So I think the larger point that you might be trying to make is that there were so many issues in Vatican II that traditional Catholics at that time couldn't buy, that why should they buy this? Anything else? All right, we'll take a break for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll finally be on topic two.
We're on topic two. I'm feeling better already. <laughs> In the academic world, it has usually been fashionable, fashionable to distinguish between a thinker and his thought, especially in the field of philosophy. That is, a philosopher's philosophical views have been viewed as the object objective intellectual products of a mind detached not only from a body, but also from a life. But in the early 20th century, this approach, that is, the approach to relate the person to his thought, was pioneered by American philosopher William James in his now classical work called Varieties of Religious Experience, which, as I mentioned, had a substantial influence on Heschel and later had a substantial influence on the existentialist philosophers in post-World War II Europe. As I also mentioned to you, for example, John Paul Sartre, in his great book, Being and Nothingness, says that an individual in search of meaning can build his or her life around what he called a project that gives meaning, coherence, and direction to his or her life. It would follow from this that if one is studying a particular thinking, identifying their project would offer a key to understanding their thinking as well as understanding the nexus between their thinking and their life. As I mentioned before in his book on Maimonides written in the 1930s, and also in his studies on studies are all written in the 1940s, Heschel attempts to understand these great medieval Jewish philosophers by seeing their philosophical and other writings through the prism of what he calls their inner life, rather than simply to analyze and to present their thinking detached from their life. Also, rather than present them primarily as only products of their historical and cultural milieu, as his teacher David Craigen wanted to do, Heschel instead focuses on the individuality and individual creativity of these and other thinkers, and focuses on how their thought, their philosophy, albeit influenced by their cultural and historical milieu, is utilized by them to work out certain fundamental personal problems that have nothing to do with their historical and cultural milieu. For example, in the beginning of his monograph on Sadia, Heschel does not begin, as most studies on Sadia do, by discussing Sadia's polemics with the Karaites, or discussing how Sadia harnessed the views of the Kalam school of contemporary Islamic philosophy to formulate a philosophy of Judaism, rather Heschel takes another approach. And here's the first uh, paragraph of the book which expresses this approach. I'm quoting, the wisdom of the philosophers is not a commodity that can be produced on demand. Their books are not responsa. We should not regard them as mirrors reflecting other people's problems, but rather as windows allowing us to view the author's soul. Philosophers do not expend their power and passion unless they themselves are personally involved. I therefore suggest that a key to understanding Heschel's thinking is to try to identify and to peer through the window to his soul to see what is the project that gives his thinking and his life cohesion and meaning and direction. 
rather than simply classify him as a certain type of thinker, influenced by certain cultural norms, I would prefer to see Heschel as Heschel would see Heschel, namely in his own individuality and in terms of his own agenda, his own projects. Hints as to the nature of this project are found throughout Heschel's work. And I want to take a look at some of these hints and then to offer a comprehensive view, that is to use Heschel's own approach to understand the very philosophical and abstract works of Sadia and Maimonides, to use that as the approach he uses to study these two medieval Jewish philosophies, philosophers in order then to understand his own thinking. As I mentioned to you on Sunday, in 1968, Heschel gave an informal talk to, part, uh, to principals of Salman Schechter schools. And in Moral Grandeur and Spiritual Audacity, pages 154 and following, which unfortunately was printed without the question and answers that followed the presentation, which I think are very important, here, Heschel identifies as one of his central concerns since his dissertation on the prophets the challenge of how to identify and how to maintain a Jewish way of thinking. So this, I think, is an important hint into his project. This statement that since his dissertation on the prophets challenge has been how to identify and maintain a Jewish way of thinking, this statement presumes a number of things. Number one, it assumes that there is such a thing as a Jewish way of thinking. Number two, it assumes, as he discusses in this essay, that a Jewish way of thinking differs from other ways of thinking, particularly from the way of thinking epitomized by Greco-German philosophy. Thirdly, it assumes, as he discusses again in this essay, that westernized Jews, for example, American Jews, are influenced by social cultural norms to think in general, and to think about Judaism in particular in a non-Jewish way. So it's not simply that American Jews are thinking in a non-Jewish way, it's that American Jews are thinking about what Judaism is with categories that are not Jewish categories. And recently a great deal has been written about this in terms of Jewish behavior patterns in America by a sociologist at uh, Brandeis University, uh, Sylvia Barak Fishman, who has called this kind of behavior uh, coalescence, by which she means um, doing things that Jews consider expressive of their Judaism that are based on concepts that have nothing to do with Judaism. And guess what her main example is? T.O. Tikkun Olam. Further, that a Jewish way of thinking may be formulated from classical Jewish religious literature, especially the Bible and the Talmud. In other words, so that when we say there's such a thing as Jewish thinking, authentic Jewish thinking, there's a way we can figure out exactly what it is, and there are sources we can go to to measure any claims against. And finally, that authentic Jewish thinking is the only viable and authentic source for authentic Jewish living. That is, in Heschel's view, that Jewish theology is the foundation for Jewish living and for religious and ethical uh, behavior. I'm sorry, and then finally, sixthly, that Jewish uh, thinking is unique. And here again we have the category of the unique. Now, 
Do you have an idea who Heschel is polemicizing against when he talks about the category of the unique besides Greek philosophers? Which one? One of his big nemesis, Jungian psychology. Because Jung had this idea of the collective consciousness where all idea, human ideas come, come together. And the person who is the big problem in all of this in contemporary scholarship on religion, and Bidel has launched a personal war against this scholar, is, any guess? Eliade. Marcia Eliade, who until his death was professor of comparative religion at the University of Chicago and the greatest scholar of religion in the world, and who based all of his theories on Jungian psychology, and who, as it happened, was a member of the Romanian Iron Guard, who were worse fascists than the Nazis and who were uh, allied with the Nazis during World War II. But that's a whole other, whole other story. And one of the reasons Ebel has so strongly attacked Gershon Scholem is because Scholem bought into the Jungian Iliada um, collective consciousness uh, motif. Now, in God in Search of Man, pages 6 to 8, Heschel defines the agenda of Jewish religious thought with the following phrase, quote, the radical self-understanding of religion, that is Judaism, in terms of its own spirit. In other words, to understand Judaism as Judaism understands itself, rather than imposing categories from outside of Judaism, to understand Judaism. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, a lot of people would say that uh, even the word theology is like a comes from a Greek or a Christian understanding. Of. Right. So, what would not mysticism or Jewish spirituality be a more Jewish term to use? Yeah, you notice in his book on Jewish theology, God in Search of Man, he doesn't use the term theology. You see, you hit upon what is really the crux of the issue. The crux of the issue is. Can you, can you talk about these issues in a language other than classical Hebrew? Not even modern Hebrew. But what happens when you start talking about all this stuff in another language? Does that other language give you an inlay or an overlay of, of concepts on the ideas you're discussing that corrupts the ideas in themselves. Now, um, let me give you what I consider to be an accurate, though extreme, idea of this, and that is, I don't know if any of you ever go to Sephardic synagogues, but Sephardic synagogues, a lot of them, they like to sing Ankel uh, Ahenu and Ladino. And uh, I, I think that it, it, the way it reads is there, Usted es nuestro, es nuestro señor, mm -hmm. usted es nuestro salvador. Now, these two words, señor and salvador, are <coughs> packed, theologically packed words. <coughs> and they have a totally different connotation in Spanish than the, the Hebrew that they're supposedly translating. And the connotations don't fit in the literature <coughs> because both of those terms are used by Spanish-speaking Catholics to refer to Jesus Christ. So, you know, where do they fit in, in, in Jewish uh, liturgy? They don't. But those are the only term, that's the only way you can translate Adonainu and, um, uh, and um, Moshiena. How else are you going to translate it in Spanish? That's the only word you have. So you, you hit the nail right on the head. And it's not only with regard to the word theology, it's with regard to everything. I mean, even if you use such an innocuous word, but a power-packed word is God. 
Now you hear people say, well, we all believe in the one God. Well, you know, I, I gave a, a talk uh, about 11, 12 years ago at an interfaith conference in London, and I was responding to this Catholic theologian, and he started by quoting John Paul II, who addressed a group of Jews visiting him in the Vatican once, and he said to them, we all worship the one God, as it is said in Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But when a Catholic says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, he thinks, or she thinks, that's proof of the Trinity. And when a Jew says it, he thinks, well, we have one God, we don't have a Trinity. Or unlike the Zoroastrians, we, we don't have a duality. We only have we only have one. So I I mentioned this at the conference, and then I quoted a uh, 13th century commentator, French Jewish commentator Yosef Bakor Shor, who has polemics in his commentary on the Torah against the Catholic uh, ideas, and he says exactly this. He says, when we say it, we mean this, but when they say it, they mean that. So even though we're saying the same words, we don't mean the same thing, even if we say them in Hebrew. <laughs> and that's why I refused, uh, with a lot of, against a lot of pressure, to sign that famous document of interfaith relations called Dabru Emet, where it says, we, Jews and Catholics, both read the same Bible. I refuse to sign it because, yes, we do read the same Bible, but we don't read the same meaning in the same verses when we read the same Bible. So if you read the same text, but you have a totally different meaning, it's no longer the same text. And so, yeah, that's, that's the key to the problem. And that's why Heschel's uh, uh, project his agenda becomes so much more important in a country like this where, uh, you know, we're speaking a language that has a lot of Protestant overtones from the culture, from the dominant culture. So it shouldn't then be surprising that most American Jews think about Jewish categories uh, in, in non-Jewish terms. And I remember years ago, my first meeting with the current cardinal of Chicago, Cardinal George, and he told me that he had written his one, he has two doctorates, and he had written one of his dissertations on, on the theme of how Catholics in the United States define their Catholic identity in Protestant terms. So... I said, well, I'm interested sort of in the same thing. And I quoted to him the statement of the Kutzke Rebbe, which Heschel quotes in his book on the Kutzke Rebbe. Uh, it's bad enough to be in the, in the exile, in the Galut, meaning in a state of alienation. It's bad enough to be in the Galus, but it's even worse to be in the Galus and not know it. And that's where we are. We're in the Galus and we don't even know it. Search of Man, Heschel defines the agenda of Jewish religious thought, as I mentioned, as the radical self-understanding of Judaism in terms of its own spirit. Excuse me. Therefore, for Heschel, religious thinking begins with the quest for self-understanding. And that's why Heschel says the Bible first question is what? First question you see in the Bible is, where are you? Where are you? Which is a question in the Hasidic interpretation, which is not asking for your GPS, but is asking for your existential situation. 
Where are you? Who are you? So for Heschel, for a person who identifies with a religious tradition, in our case Judaism, there must be a confluence between individual self-understanding and self-understanding within the context of the Jewish tradition. What is the Jewish tradition? For Heschel, it's the classical Jewish tradition. What is the Jewish tradition? It's not a mainstream. It's the many streams. On page 5 of God in Search of Man, Heschel makes an important distinction between what he calls conceptual thinking and situational thinking. Conceptual thinking is abstract, detached thinking from living, detached from the inner life. Situational thinking is knowledge of the self, which comes from the problems of the inner life, of spiritual existence, regarding issues, to quote Heschel, issues on which we state our very existence. Heschel's quest to identify and formulate authentic Jewish thinking begins as I mentioned with his German volume, The Prophecy on the Prophets, which he wrote, as you know, before the Holocaust. But after the Holocaust, and because of the Holocaust, and in response to the Holocaust, for Heschel, the formulation of authentic Jewish thinking becomes critical, because after the Holocaust, it is in danger of being lost. After the Holocaust, we're in danger of a second Holocaust brought by Jews on themselves, destroying their own spiritual tradition. <coughs> this, in Heschel's view, is the ultimate threat to Jewish continuity and to Jewish spiritual experience. For Heschel, in his book, Who is Man? Thinking cannot be the same after Auschwitz and Hiroshima. That is, there are new urgent existential questions that have to be addressed. And for Heschel, rather than employ categories of thought from Western culture, Western culture being seen now in all its flaws as a result of the Holocaust, one can now utilize a particular approach of Jewish thinking to respond to universal human issues. The question of how to apply Jewish wisdom and thought to contemporary problems presumes an understanding of what Jewish thinking is to begin with. And for Jews, this means self-understanding within the context of Judaism, which presumes erudition in the Jewish sources. Thus, for Heschel, the paradigm of Jewish thinking is not the Sephardic approach, which is bicultural, not the approach of medieval Jewish philosophy, but rather looking to the wellsprings of East European Jewry for recapturing the nature of the depths of Jewish spirituality and Jewish thought. In 1963, in an interview with the Yiddish newspaper, Heschel said, and here's the quote, Since I came to America, I keep speaking about East European Jewry and not forgetting the source, the crown of Jewry, is the primary task for American Jewry. With certain exceptions, American Jews have made great efforts to forget their roots. Modern Jewish leaders have no understanding of these roots. This is the main tragedy of our generation. How can we expect the tree to bloom without the roots? A world has vanished. But we of this generation still hold the key. Unless we remain to unlock it, the holiness of the ages will remain a secret of God. If we mislay the key, we shall elude ourselves. We are either the last Jews or those who will hand over the entire past to generations yet to come. And in this interview with the Yiddish newspaper, he particularly derives 
the secular Jewish intellectuals, what he calls the plate lickers of non-Jewish culture, who are detached from the wellsprings of Jewish tradition, who were, in his words, blinded by the light of Western civilization, and who could not therefore appreciate the value of the small fire of our eternal light. For Jewish continuity to be assured, for the wisdom of the past to address the perplexities of the present, the day has to come when the hidden light of East European Jewry may again be revealed. In The Earth is the Lord's, Heschel depicts East European Judaism as the quintessence of Judaism, the crystallization of the best of Jewish spirituality as a way of living, thinking, and looking at the world. For Heschel, the spiritual wisdom of East European Jewry offers not only an authentic foundation for American Jewish life and thought, but also a wisdom tradition that, in his words, quote, the world is hungry to hear as it confronts contemporary problems. For Heschel, a culture is best evaluated not by its artistic or scientific achievements, but by the quality of inwardness, holiness, and spiritual integrity manifested in the daily life of the people. For Heschel, in Jewish history, this highest degree of inwardness was attained by Ashkenazic Jewry, particularly in Eastern Europe, and especially by the followers of Hasidism. This, for Heschel, was the now decimated, in his words, golden period in Jewish history golden period in the history of the Jewish soul. Okay? <coughs> now, if you look at... What? Good question. Sure comes from his life. Hmm? Sure comes from his life. That's the point. Yeah. If you look at God in Search of Man, page 23, note 8, very few people read the notes, you find a statement which is one of the most important and most telling statements in Heschel's writings because it gives you a key to understanding uh, his work and to understanding his uh, methodology. Here Heschel defines the quest for Jewish thinking and Jewish self-understanding in a manner that undermines the approach of classical theology, medieval Jewish philosophy, the Sephardic approach, and the modern approach that flows from it. In note 8, he makes a distinction, a sharp distinction, between what he calls Greek thinking and biblical thinking as alternative ways of looking at the world. And as alternative systems of categories of thought and ethics as being so different from one another that one is meaningless to the other as if they're speaking different languages which the other one does not understand. And as I already discussed with you, this leads him to his critique of the history of Western theology as having been based on a mistake beginning with Philo of Alexandria in the first century before the Common Era, the mistake being the assumption that Jewish tradition, beginning with the Bible, and Western tradition, beginning with Greek philosophy, are predicated on two different, what they call in German, Weltanschauung, worldviews. Two different ways of looking at the world, two different systems of ethics, two different um, uh, systems of, of categories of thought, two completely different vocabularies. Now, besides all the things that we already discussed, this has certain profound implications, uh, even today. For example, election day is coming soon. And you always hear all the politicians talk about a Judeo-Christian ethics in America. If Christian ethics has its roots in Greek thought, and Jewish ethics has its roots in Jewish thought, 
there is no Christian Judeo Christian ethic. There's a Jewish ethic and there's a Christian ethic. There is no Jew, Judeo Christian ethic. It also has profound implications in how we do theology. If we go by the old agenda, we're always trying to reconcile the current fashion of thought with Jewish thought, whatever we happen to think either one is. But for Heschel, this is the wrong assumption. The correct assumption is to try to find out what authentic Jewish thought has to say about the subject without any reference to the Western tradition, except maybe to contrast it with the Western uh, tradition. This also has tremendous implications sociologically, because sociologically speaking, this leads to the attempt at a bicultural symbiosis. We're living in two cultures at the same time, and are we trying to say they're both saying the same thing in different languages? And if they're saying very different things in different languages, this leads to a kind of schizophrenia. You know, that's why Jews in the United States have always been trying to show that uh, American values, whatever they might be, uh, are really compatible with Jewish values because they want to show they're the same. But are they the same? Or are they all the same? Or are some of them the same? But if you assume that they're all the same, um, how do you know that uh, what the distinctive Jewish values are? If they're in conflict and you're an American Jew, then you're living in conflict. I mean, let, let get back to Kaplan for a minute, because Kaplan was a big advocate of the bicultural model. And one of the critiques of Kaplan was, which he understood very well uh, from his own potential followers, they said to him, well, if you already have the American uh, value system, what do you need a second value system for? What do you need to live in two cultures at the same time when you already have one? Why do you need a Jewish religious civilization when you already have an American religious civilization or an American civilization? Why do you need two if you already have one? Isn't the one enough? Isn't it complicated enough to live in one? Why do you, why do you need to complicate it more in order to live two? Yeah. Well, you've taught us American Jews have no problem because they, they absorb American ethics and call them Jewish ethics. So there's no conflict. <laughs> yeah, but that's being an exile and not knowing. Uh, that's that's, that, but they have no schizophrenia. <laughs> they have no schizophrenia until they find out you know, <coughs> what the facts are. I mean, it, it's like, you know, I wrote an article years ago about the meaning of Hanukkah. Now, if you look at America, uh, American views of Hanukkah, uh, let's say Brandeis views of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, Brandeis says, is expressive of American constitutional values uh, of freedom and democracy. Then you read the story of Hanukkah. Along come the Hasmoneans. And what are the first thing they do after the story of Hanukkah is over and they reestablish the temple? The Hasmoneans? They start a, a monar monarchical dynasty. This is American democracy. I mean, what book of the Maccabees was Brandeis reading? Probably never read it. But what happens, you know, when you, when you see it as it is? You have a problem. And I think that, you know, the immigrant generation and the generation after the immigrant generation, American Jews were so anxious to put the two together that they didn't want to see what was really going on. Now, they don't feel as threatened, I think, so, you know, they do see, and now they have to figure out a way to put it, to put it together. Uh, and they, or on the other hand, they're secure enough to say that I don't feel threatened anymore, you know, if I'm out of sync with 
with American civilization. I'm, I'm so much a part of this country that, you know, I, it's not my problem. I don't feel out of sync, no matter what I think. So it's a different situation. And I think for American Jews, a, a more difficult situation than a generation ago. Hmm. I mean, I remember in the 50s, the ADL put out a series of books on the Jewish holidays called Jews Celebrate Too. <coughs> and the whole purpose of the series was trying to show how Jews celebrate holidays that are exact parallels of Christian and civil holidays. Uh, so therefore, we're not so different, and therefore, we, you know, we can fit in. But, you know, Hanukkah is not Christmas. Passover is not Easter. And uh, Yom HaAtzmaut is not Independence Day. We celebrate Yom HaAtzmaut. So, you know, you need new paradigms. That's not Heschel's problem. His problem is we have to save the authentic stuff so we know what's authentic and we can therefore evaluate what's outside based on what's authentic. I think we're out of time. <laughs>